Hello everyone and welcome to today's video podcast for evolution and diversity. This will be the second video on animal diversity. And today we're going to talk about these two objectives. The first is to distinguish the features of the ectozoans, of the ectozoans. And then the second objective is to talk about the defining features of the deuterostomes. So the ectozoans will include all of these down here and we'll spend some time talking about nematodes and arthropods. The other two phylum we won't talk about today. And then the last objective will focus on the deuterostomes down here. Question I have over here is which of these are monophyletic groups? Animals, lophochocozoans that we talked about last time, ectodozoans that we're going to talk about today, protostomes and deuterostomes. So look this over and if you want to you can hit pause and try to decide which of these are monophyletic groups. It turns out that these are all monophyletic groups. They all have a common ancestor, and that common ancestor has all of the descendants, and only those descendants. So let's talk a little bit more about these ectozoans. Unlike the lophotrochozoans that grow incrementally, as you can see in this clam here, where each layer is evidence of that clam's growth. It just adds on to the clam. Ectozoans, however, they grow by molting. So periodically, they will shed their outer layer or their cuticle. So they shed this exoskeleton. So this is a picture here of a cicada. As it's removing its old exoskeleton, it emerges, and now it doesn't have that exoskeleton. But it'll grow a new one. So what is the benefit of the exoskeleton? And then what is the disadvantage of shedding it, as these species do? I'm not going to answer that now. We might come to it in class. If not, you can remind me of this question, then, I'll, then we can talk about it. So let's move to our first phylum of the ectozoans, and that is the phylum of Nematoda. These are our roundworms. All roundworms share this one synapomorphy, and that is that they have a cuticle. This cuticle is this outer covering that surrounds the entire roundworm, and it's made of proteins. Okay, let's talk about the phylum Nematoda and how members of this phylum feed. It turns out that most of these are free living species, meaning they don't live inside of a host. Rather, they are most often predators. That means they are feeding on other organisms, most often bacteria, archaea, fungi, plant roots, small protists, or animals that are smaller than them, as we see in this picture down here where we see one nematode on the left eating another nematode, a smaller nematode, on the right. Now, in addition to being predators, some of them are saprophytic, meaning that they feed off of dead and decaying organisms. Some are also parasitic, and we'll talk about several examples of nematodes that are parasitic in just a little bit. So let's talk about how nematode move. They don't have circular muscles, and so they don't move quite the same way that we see worms move, say, like in the segmented worms. But they have this thrashing motion. In this particular video here, it doesn't necessarily look like they're getting very far fast, but, these, the, but this video is showing them in a liquid suspension. When they're on a solid surface, they, they can move um, quite well. Okay, so let's talk about reproduction within nematoda. Nematodes reproduce sexually, and within that, most of them are dioecious, as we see in the picture below, where members are either male or female. However, some are monoecious. C. elegans, which is a very common model organism that scientists study, is one of these that is monoecious. It's a hermaphrodite, so it produces eggs and sperm in the same worm. Speaking of C. elegans, it is one of these worms that's used very commonly in research. In fact, we have some scientists in our department that study C. elegans. So it's a very common model organism, and it's used to study a wide variety of research questions. An interesting fact about C. elegans is that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, when there was a rush to start to sequence various organisms, C. elegans was the first multicellular organism that had its genome sequenced. This was a huge breakthrough in research, where we had an entire organism with its sequenced genome, and it allowed scientists to go in and look at specific genes and to see what happens if one gene is removed or another gene, say, is overexpressed. Now, today, many organisms have their genome sequence, including humans. But at the time, this was a huge breakthrough, and it still is a huge breakthrough. Let's talk about a few parasites. I'm gonna talk about five different parasites here. 
The first two are shown on this image here. So the first one is pinworms. This is a very common parasitic roundworm. It's mainly found in kids, but not exclusively. It infects about 40 million people a year in the United States. Its main symptom is that it causes anal itching. And so this is often widespread by kids because they may scratch their anus and then without washing their hands, they'll touch a toy or they'll touch something else. And, and then another kid comes along and picks it up and um, little kids are known for touching things and putting their hands in their mouth. And so it's easy to be transmitted um, amongst kids. Essentially it gets spread because of poor hygiene, people not washing their hands. Fortunately, it, it is easily treated. And even if it's left untreated and a, a family or, or a place undergoes very rigorous hygiene, it'll go away in about six weeks. But there are medicines that can treat it much faster than six weeks. The next one I want to talk about is hookworm. And this is one where it's most often transmitted through the soil. So if you're walking barefooted on contaminated soil, this is when the hookworm shown here on the left, this is an electromicrograph image of the hookworm. And so you can see how it got its name from these hooks. It'll bind onto you and it will um, penetrate your skin and infect you. We commonly see these infections in feet as we see in this image below here. These are also fairly easily treated if they are caught early enough. Okay, let's talk about these next two. Trigonella, which is the roundworm shown to the upper left here. It's not as common in the US, only a few cases reported every year. It used to be much more common. It's transmitted usually through raw or undercooked meat, and usually that meat that it's transmitted through is pork. It can have symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting, ab abdominal pains, and this can last for months, even after treatment. One of the more interesting ones here is this worm here on the bottom, which is called Vucherin Bancroft. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. It blocks the lymphatic vessels and causes an inflammation. And so you see this inflammation most dramatically in people with the disease elephantitis. And so you see somebody over here where the, their left leg has been infected with this roundworm. And it has caused this severe inflammation in their legs. The last one I want to talk about is heartworm. And so if you own a dog or if you're ever going to own a dog, it's really important that um, you have them checked for heartworms and that you give them their monthly heartworm medicine. Even in doing so, uh, sometimes a dog could still become infected with this. It's also transmitted through mosquitoes to dogs. It's detected um, at your vet's office through a blood test. If it's caught early, it can be treated, but usually it's about a four to six month treatment before your dog is completely cleared of the heartworm. If it's not treated, this, this will almost certainly lead to death of the dog. You may wonder if cats and humans can also get heartworm, and they can actually get heartworms. However, cats and humans turn out to be not a very hospitable host for heartworms. So usually if they even can penetrate our skin and get into us, they don't usually cause any problems because they usually die shortly after they enter a cat or a human's body. A couple of interesting facts that I, maybe I haven't mentioned yet about um, roundworms is that they're quite abundant. In a typical acre of pasture land, there will be about 9 billion roundworms. And also when scientists have studied a, a rotten apple, um, they find about 90,000 of these roundworms in them. So in addition to them being important medically speaking, because of the parasitic nature of many of them, they are also an incredibly important organism for ecological stability. As I said on the last few slides, um, they are a leading cause of many parasitic infections, but many of these infections are preventable or treatable. And as I said earlier, some roundworms are incredibly important for genetics research in that they serve as very good model organisms. Okay, let's move on to this next phylum, and this includes these four different groups. The millipedes and the centipedes, the crustaceans, which include shrimps, lobsters, crabs, barnacles, isopods and copods, insects, a very large part of the phylum Anthropoda, and then the group here, spiders, scorpions, horseshoe crabs, ticks, and mites. Some of the synapomorphies for arthropods include having an exoskeleton made up of chitin. They also have these jointed appendages that you see down here where you see their walking legs. A term here that you should know is tegmata, and this is grouping of segments into functional units. So for instance, these are similar segments that are grouped into a unit. So we have like a cephalothorax, which is near the top, and the abdomen, which is near the middle of the organism. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next category, and that is how arthropods feed. All arthropods will have specialized mouth parts to assist in their feeding. 
Now you don't need to remember all of these different kinds of parts that we see in um, the variety of, of, of mouths that we see in arthropods. However, you should know these four different ways that the mouth parts allow the different arthropods to eat. Depending on the species, they might chew their food, they might lap their food, they might siphon their food, or they might pierce and then suck the food. Depending on the species, there's a variety of things that they may feed upon, including different prey, detritus, nectar, or blood. Now let's talk about movement. Arthropods have a variety of ways to move. They have these jointed appendages that we talked about a few slides ago. And these appendages help them walk, run, jump, and swim. In addition, many arthropods can also fly. Arthropods reproduce mostly sexually, and in most cases, they are dioecious. Now let's talk about a few interesting things about arthropods. When we think about the number of species of arthropods and compare it to other animals, we quickly see that there are more species of arthropods than all other animals combined. And this is illustrated down here in this pie graph where we see the number of insect species in this light blue compared to all the other different species of animals and plants and bacteria and archaea. They're also very numerous. 80% of all animals on Earth are arthropods. In the evolution of land animals, arthropods were the first. They were the first to walk on land. They can get quite big, as you see down here in the bottom left picture, this person holding the Japanese spider crab, which, which can be as big as 12 feet 6 inches across. As we've seen in other examples, the venom of arthropods are used in various medical treatments and therapies. Spider venom and bee venom is used to treat pain and inflammation. More specifically, venom from tarantulas is used in research to treat muscular dystrophy. Scorpion venom is used in research to treat things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. All right, now let's move on to the next learning objective, and we're going to talk about the various features of the durostomes, and we're going to focus on the echinodermata and the chordata. Okay, let's go ahead and begin our discussion of the phylum Echinodermata. There are five groups here of the Echinodermata that we want to talk about and we'll refer to throughout this short discussion. The sea stars, the incredibly interesting sea cucumbers, sea urchins, feather stars, and the brittle stars. So a few synapomorphies of Echinodermatas. They have this water vascular system shown right here. It opens to the outside and water comes in through here and is moved around and water is moved around with inside of the organism using internal cilia. They have these specialized feet that we'll talk about in a moment that they're using for movement. And they have a skeleton made of calcium carbonate. Within the phylum Echinodermata, there are many kinds of feeding behaviors. Feather stars and sea cucumbers, they are suspension feeders. Sea stars and brittle stars, they're predators. And I'm gonna show a video of that in just a moment. And sea urchins, shown here on the right, they are herbivores. But let's go ahead and look at this video showing how sea stars will hunt for their prey. And you can see one right here in the middle here, a tiny clam here. So you're gonna see the sea stars moving here pretty fast, but this is time-lapse photography, so they don't move nearly this fast. They're pretty slow, but they're also very voracious feeders as well, as we'll see here in a moment. So you see several of these sea stars moving up the structure here, and you're going to see them crawling over a whole bunch of clams. And they're looking for one that is open a little bit. As long as the clams are shut, the sea star can't get to them. But they're using these two feet here that they use for movement. They're also using them to sense and try to find one of these clams that's open. And here's an unsuspecting clam. and they have inserted a tiny camera inside of, inside of it so we can see what happens. It's pretty fascinating. So the tubular feet will penetrate first, determining that it is open, and then what we're going to see is the stomach of the sea star will be inserted inside of the clam here. And you can begin to see it being pushed in, and it's being pushed in right now, and it will expand with inside of the clam here. And at this point, it's just too late. It will begin to do, secrete digestive chemicals and digestive enzymes, and it will turn the 
muscle with inside the, the clam here into essentially a soup. And it will absorb that into the sea star digestive system. And when it's done here in just a moment, it's going to pull the stomach back into the sea star, leaving behind an empty shell. And we'll see that here in just a moment, once it's done eating. Okay, it's pulled back in. And it leaves it, its victim behind. All right, now there's also a video I'd like to show you on how the sea cucumber feeds. And they do this very interesting thing where they burrow into the ground and then they shoot out these tentacles that they use to suspension feed with. And then they also do something very interesting where if a predator tries to come along and eat it, it will literally spit out its guts at it. And in that guts there are sticky substances and toxins that will kill anything that's trying to attack it. And so it's a pretty good defense mechanism. Now I can't show the video because of copyright issues, but the video is on the PowerPoint that is in Blackboard. So if you want to watch that, you can. All right, let's go ahead and move to the way Echinodermata move. And I've already alluded to this, and you also saw this when you watched the sea stars feed on the clams. And so they have these tubular feet that we can watch move here, and they will um, help the organisms move along surfaces. And they also help detect certain things as well, just like we saw earlier when they detected the opening of the clam. Echinodermata, they will reproduce in various ways. However, the most common way is through sexual reproduction. And most of the echinoderms are dioecious, having separate male and females in the groups. Some of the echinodermata, like the sea stars and the brittle stars, they will reproduce by fragmentation. If you break off a arm of the sea star, it will regenerate an entire new sea star. Some interesting things about Echinodermata, some we've already mentioned, but let's just go ahead and throw them out here again. Speaking of throwing things out, we saw in the video how sea stars can extrude their stomachs through their mouths into the organism that they are feeding upon. In addition, sea cucumbers can also do the similar thing where they will spit out their guts and that will scare off various um, predators. Sea urchins, we know they can live for a very long time. They can live up to 200 years in the wild, maybe even longer. Now let's move on to talk about the phylum chordata. As we'll see in a moment, the chordates have a few things that they all have in common, these synapomorphies. And you can see then as the different chordates evolved that they took on various adaptations that unified certain groups. Developing a cranium, a vertebrate, paired sense organs occurred here and gave rise to everything over here. And then jaws and lungs and lobed fins, limbs. We see limbs developing here giving rise to amphibia, mammals, and reptiles. An amniotic egg developed here, and that turned out to be incredibly important for the evolution of mammals and reptiles. And we'll come back and talk about many of these groups over the next day or two. The purpose of the next few slides here is just to introduce you to the chordates. So all chordates have these four things in common. Pharyngeal slits or pouches, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a nodal cord, and a muscular post-anal tail. Now some of these features, as we'll learn, are only seen in the embryo, and in other cases they're found in the embryo and as an adult. Let's first talk about the nodal cord. This is the synapomorphy that gives rise to the entire name of the phylum. It is this cartilage-based rod that gives support to the, to the individual animals. Now in some animals, that is in the vertebrates, the nodal cord will become the vertebral column in vertebrates. Next, let's talk about the pharyngeal slits. In aquatic vertebrates, like fish, these pharyngeal slits will become the gill slits or the gill arches that provide support for the gills. Now, what about chordates that are not aquatic? They will still have the pharyngeal slits as an embryo, as you see here on the left side. But as that embryo develops, and as early as 20 weeks gestational age, those gill slits have developed into something other than the gill slits. They will become the bones of the lower jaw, middle ear, and the voice box. You can see all the terms listed here in the picture. You don't need to know all of them. All I want you to know is that the pharyngeal slits become the bones of the lower jaw, the middle ear, and the voice box. Let's talk about this third feature found in chordates, the dorsal hollow nerve cord. It's shown here in this bluish purple color, and you can see it 
in the embryo. It's all along here and extends the length of the embryo. This will develop into the brain and the spinal cord of adults that you see on the right side. And we say it is dorsal to the nodal cord. So the nodal cord, remember, will become this spinal column down here, and I'll just trace it here with this red line. This is the vertebral column that was developed from the nodal cord. And the dorsal hollow nerve cord that becomes the spinal cord will be dorsal to it. And dorsal just is a directional term meaning towards the back. Ventral is to the front, dorsal is to the back. Okay, let's talk about this last synapomorphy of chordatus. All members of the phylum chordata have a post-anal tail during embryonic development. And you can see it here in this diagram, right here. And this is what you're going to see in all chordates at some point during embryonic development. Here's an image of a human embryo, and you can see it has that post-anal tail right there. Now we know many animals are not born with a tail, including the apes. So the apes include chimps, gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, and humans. None of them have tails. So, so what happens to that tail? Well, through a process of apoptosis, which is this programmed cell death of these cells right here, the tail, through development, will begin to retract, or more appropriately, it begins to die off. So that when we're born, that is members of the ape family, we don't have a tail. However, as you can see in this picture here, every now and then, a human is born with a tail. And it's usually not a big deal. It can be associated with a few syndromes that might be concerning. In most cases, the tail can just be removed with a simple surgical procedure. But usually the tail is lost. When we think about the feeding pattern of the members of Cordata, we classify them mostly as mass feeders. And all that means is that most members of Cordata ingest large chunks of food. Okay, so let's talk about the movement patterns of the members of the phylum Cordata. And as you're aware, there are many different ways that chordates can move. They can fly like we see in this picture of a bird or run, like we see in this picture of, I believe that's a dog. And um, they can swim like fish do, or in this picture they show an elephant swimming, which is kind of fun to watch. Um, they can jump like kangaroos, they can walk like dogs. My dog does not seem to walk very much. It seems just want to either sit or run. They can slide like we see in snakes. So they have a lot of variety in their movement patterns. Finally, let's talk about the reproduction patterns of the members of Cordata. Mostly chordates reproduce sexually, and mostly they are dioecious, having both male and female individuals. Now in some cases, we will see asexual reproduction by parthenogenesis, and that's usually found in fish and reptiles. But we can see them in rare cases in birds, and as you saw in the case that we did a few classes ago, we have seen them with sharks. But usually we would see them in fish or reptiles. And even fish and reptiles usually will reproduce sexually. And so being dioecious, they have both adult males and adult females that have testes and ovaries respectively, and produce sperm and eggs also respectively, that then will fertilize each other to produce the diploid zygote that will develop into an embryo and a fetus, and then as an adult. In this case, adult human, but it's the same process that we were talking about, adult rhinoceroses. All right, that's all I have for today's video podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you reach out to me. If not, I will see you in class. Bye for now.